Hydra for Heroes strives each day to give back to our deserving military veterans by assisting them through challenges and transitions in civilian life. A registered nonprofit organization based in Plymouth, we provide support services to veterans who need a helping hand from throughout southeastern Massachusetts. We offer a range of services, including adaptive home renovations, vehicle modifications, specialized mobility equipment, qualified home repairs, and custom veteran and family support. If you or someone you know is a veteran in need of assistance, please contact us to fill out an application. We also offer workforce readiness programs for veterans, including a success readiness series, which features seminars and webinars on job seeking and life skills, as well as Incline Corps, a unique monthly fitness program exclusively for veterans. To learn more about Hydra for Heroes or our programs, to watch a webinar, or to make a donation to support our work, please visit our website at www.hydraforheroes.org. That's H-E-I-D-R-E-A, the number four, H-E-R-O-E-S dot org. Our veterans sacrificed a great deal to serve our country. It is our great honor to give back by lending a helping hand. Hey guys, um, thank you for coming today. Uh, my name is Greg Killey. I work at Concord Wealth Management and uh, today we'll be talking about achieving financial success basically in retirement. Um, I brought along today my president and CEO of the company, John Laredo. And um, there's not a better man to explain all this stuff than him. So if you please uh, welcome John. Oh, all right, thanks. Thank you. All righty, good to see everybody. Uh, great to have everybody here and I uh, appreciate your, your uh, attending tonight. We want to make this as valuable for you as possible. We want to make it as interactive. So I know we've got some time blocked off at the end for some questions and answers. Uh, but if you have questions on anything we're going through, just let us know. We can stop and we'll talk a little bit more in depth about whatever topic that you like. But uh, today we're going to talk about achieving financial success, which there's a lot of things for us to talk about. We're going to try and kind of boil as much down in our session tonight as we can. Um, we wanna make this as actionable as we can so that you can leave here with some ideas that you can actually do something with. Um, at the same point, one of the things we also recognize is everybody's in a different situation. So your situation's unique. Um, you may be dealing with specific goals that obviously are unique to you. Your situation is unique. So the answers and the solutions and steps you should take are also unique. So we also want to throw out the opportunity for you to um, take advantage of, an of a consultation. No obligation, of course, but that's just a chance to sit down, talk in depth about your goals and some of the things that we may be talking about tonight, um, and you'll have an opportunity to request that. So I think everybody has a comment card. Is that right? Did everybody get one? Okay, well, at the end of today, you'll get, <coughs> excuse me, and I'm dealing with a little bit of a cough. But uh, you'll get a comment card and uh, feedback uh, opportunity to give us some feedback. And then the comment card will also be a chance for you to request a consultation. Um, and just uh, do, doing so, we'll follow up with you a schedule of time that would work for you. All right. So let's start. What's that? Uh, so we have two offices. We're in Waltham and then we're also in Braintree. Uh, those are our two main spots, and then we have a few satellite locations around. So, but uh, we can make sure we can meet at a place that's convenient for you. All right. So, um, let me start off with we're going to talk about ideas and strategies around achieving financial success. And I know that there's tons of different definitions. Um, I'm interested to get your thoughts on when you think about financial success. What does financial success mean? What does it look like to you? Any thoughts? Comfortability. Okay. Not living paycheck to paycheck. Okay, great. Yeah, being comfortable, kind of stress-free, not living pay to paycheck to paycheck. Anything else? Not having to work. Okay, that's a great one. So we define financial independence as that point where work is optional and retirement is affordable. So if you are working, it's because you want to, not because you have to, not because you have to earn a paycheck. So when we talk about financial success, we talk about financial independence. Okay, just having you be able to be in a situation where you're stress-free, you can do the things you love doing. If you're retired, you can travel, you can do whatever you enjoy doing without the stresses of money. Okay, so is it fair to say that 
money is a pretty high stress uh, factor for most people. Okay. You know, it's one of the leading causes of divorce. It's, one of the it's also a leading cause of even health stress related issues. So um, it's an issue, no doubt. So getting yourself in a really good, successful financial place has a lot of different benefits. Uh, so we're gonna talk about some simple, some basic steps. We'll talk about some more advanced stuff that you know, we'll, won't get into too much depth, but just kind of share with you some thoughts just to get the wheels turning a little bit, all right? Perfectly natural for many people when they think about, okay, getting started uh, toward financial goals, the getting started part is the hardest part. Is that fair to say? Okay, so we deal with clients and one of the biggest obstacles that we find people face is procrastination. Simply by not taking action, you're not gonna achieve your goals. So if you do nothing, you have to assume you're gonna make zero progress. Okay, so that's the first obstacle is just overcoming procrastination. So before we get into um, a little bit of, of the detail of what we're gonna uh, talk about, let me start off with a, uh, and I'm gonna write on the board, is that right if I go over here? And, the camera will follow me, I guess. So um, let's just talk about uh, one of the first important steps of financial planning. And that's whatever your dreams are, your vision is, it's starting with setting goals, all right? So who's, who's pretty good at setting goals or who does that on a regular basis? Anybody? <coughs> Halfway. Okay, so kind of a little bit. Okay, so here's the biggest thing that I find. First of all, your chances of achieving a goal go up by doing a couple, couple real simple things. Um, Harvard University did a study, how you doing? Harvard University did a study, and this was a study in regards to the, um, the correlation between setting goals. Basically, does goal setting even mean anything? Does it make a difference? They did this study over 10 years, and what they did is they took a bunch of Harvard MBA grads, pretty smart people, and they looked at what their track record was over the next 10 years after they graduated and whether it had anything to do with the fact that they set goals. Okay, so they actually took this group of Harvard MBA students and what they found is, believe it or not, uh, what, well let me ask you this, what percentage of those graduates do you think actually had specific written goals? Yeah, it's even smaller. So 3% had specific, well, written goals, they had actually written them down, okay, 11% uh, did not write them down, but they had goals, and the balance, which is 86%, had no goals that they could actually say, they, they had no specific goals. Pretty alarming, right? I thought that was pretty alarming. I'm like, wow, Harvard MBA grows, you would think that would be like the first thing that they teach you. What they then did is 10 years later, they looked at the income of this group. Okay, and let's just say for the purposes of this study that this group here, and if you look at it, Harvard MBA grads today, the average uh, salary uh, when they graduate is 120 grand a year. Pretty good, plus a 20 grand signing bonus. So let's just say for this illustration, this group was earning 120 grand. How much do you think this group was earning? What would be your guess? Okay, even higher. Two. 240, they were earning twice this. Okay, and you can Google this, it's an interesting study. What do you think this group is earning? 350. Higher. 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 We're talking big money. This group, believe it or not, was earning 10 times this group right here. They were earning on average $1.2 million per year, 10 years after they graduated. Pretty amazing. So if you think about it, that's not random. You know, that's not an accident. Goal setting makes a difference. And it's not just writing down goals and all of a sudden you're gonna achieve them. We're gonna talk about a whole bunch of stuff. But the first thing is, yeah, if you do write down your goals, your chances of achieving them actually do go up. That is a, a fact. So I don't know if anybody, has anybody actually carried their goals with them, whether it's on your phone or in your pocket or your wallet or your purse or whatever? Okay, try that. Actually, you know, and then maybe a step, out, an action step for tonight would be to actually write down your goals. Just pick, five goals, three goals, whatever it is that are important to you to accomplish, you know, over the next six months, maybe next year, you go into this year, you know, New Year's resolutions, what a better time to set some goals, all right? When you set goals, there are good goals and not so good goals. So we use something when we deal with it, when we uh, talk to our clients, we use what we call the SMART test. 
for goal setting. Anybody heard of this acronym before? <laughs> and I don't know if you can see this. I don't know if this is blocking. Do you see what I'm writing up here? So the SMART test, this is a really good acro acronym to just ask yourself, okay, am I setting good goals? Okay, the S, any, gu any guess on what that stands for? Is my goal, okay, it's actually one of the words up here, specific. And this is not even uh, specific, this is not even financial goals. This is any kind of goal. Is it specific enough or is it too general? What is M? M would be measurable. Okay. A is a little tricky. That's actionable. So is it something I can actually control? Can I, can I impact it? It's not like my goal would be, hey, I hope it's sunny tomorrow. I have nothing to do with that. Okay. R, any guesses? It's reasonable. Reasonable or realistic? Okay. What happens if I set a goal that's way too aggressive? Okay. It's gonna, I'm going to get demotivated because it's way too hard. If my goal is I'm going to be an NBA player in three years, that's not going to happen. I'm going to be pretty disgruntled and disappointed. If it's too easy, what happens? That's also demotivating too. You got to set the right level goal. Uh, T, what does that stand for? Time frame. Time frame or time bound. So it's got to be bound by a time frame. So let me give an example. If I said my goal is to, uh, my goal is to lose 10 pounds. Okay, is that specific? Yeah, yeah measurable. Yep, actionable, right? Realistic. Yep, but it's missing the time bound. Got to put a time to it. If I said, hey, I want to be the best dad I can possibly be, that's an honorable, admirable goal, but is it specific and measurable? I can't, you know, I, can't, I, don't, know, I don't know how to say yes or no. You know, if I said, hey, I want to take a vacation with my kids next year, I want to do it for a week, and I want to go somewhere, I want to go to Disney, whatever, that's, you know, specific, measurable, actionable, realistic. Does that make sense? Okay, so just try to kind of apply that acid test to your goals. And again, if you leave here and say, hey, I'm going to set three goals, I'm going to make sure they pass the SMART test, and I'm going to write them down, and I'm going to carry them with, car carry them with me, then if you do nothing else as a result of today's workshop, you've made progress. You've made a lot of it, okay? And you will make a lot of progress, all right? Okay, so let's, uh, <coughs> let's cover a couple things. We're going to talk... <coughs> We're going to hit on each of these areas a little bit. So we're going to talk about financial planning, the concept, what it is, how to do it. Uh, we're going to talk about protection planning, which is a, an oftentimes overlooked of part of somebody's financial plan. Uh, wealth accumulation, we're going to talk about some ideas on how to build up your assets. Uh, retirement planning, we'll talk about that. That's a most common and important goal. A little bit on estate planning, a little bit on business planning. We're not going to spend too much time on that. We're going to spend a little bit more on the other three. All right, but again, if you've got questions, you want to go into more stuff, we're happy to do that, and we'll leave a lot of time you know, at the end if we have questions on anything. So <clears throat> here's what financial planning is all about. Financial planning is getting somebody and getting you from point A to point B in the most direct and intelligent fashion. All right, that's really, really easy. So it's how do I get from where I am to where I want to be. Where you want to be, that's up to you. You know, maybe it's a net worth goal. Maybe it's a, you know, it's a retirement goal. It's college planning. It's taking a trip. It's buying a house. Whatever it is, those are your goals, and it's getting you from where you are to that point. Um, when you start early, the earlier the better. Everybody says, hey, you know, I should have done this five years ago, ten years ago. There's never a better time than right now, right? Because you could wait two, three years, and it's going to be that much harder. The amount that you have to save toward your goals is going to be that much harder. Okay, no better time than to start right now. Okay, and you can even start small. Get something going, which is better than nothing, and build on that. What's interesting too is people that have a formal plan <coughs> say, <laughs> save on average three times as much money as people that don't have a plan. Okay, and there's nothing more powerful than your ability to save income, save your money, that's gonna impact your success. There's nothing more powerful to you being in a financially independent place down the road than you saving money. It's not getting your investments working harder, that's a piece of it, but there's nothing that's gonna help you more than taking a chunk of your money and saving it, okay? So let's just talk about that for a couple minutes. What's a good rule of thumb? Anybody have an idea in terms of your, your, your income, what percentage of your income you should be saving? 10. 10% is a good, that's kind of an overall good rule, uh, you know, benchmark, rule of thumb. What we work with our clients on is, especially if somebody's got multiple goals, like retirement and college, which is typical, 
uh, we've got kids that want to plan for college, we look at 20% as really trying to get our clients up to that point, which may sound like, wow, hey, I can't do 20%. If you start at five and then you go to six, I was just meeting with some clients earlier today. I said, listen, if you start at six and you get it up to 7% next year, then 8% the next year, awesome. Can you increase it by 1% your savings rate every single year? But here's the interesting thing, okay? So let's just say we want to be saving, ideally, 10% plus, ideally 20%, okay? So let me ask you this. You've got basically your income minus your expenses. And what is that number? What's that n number, but what's that call that's left over? Anybody know? So we've got, in yeah, spendable or discretionary income. Okay, and this is the amount that you can save. Okay, so here's something that's interesting. You may say, hey, I have what I have at the end of the month. Sometimes you may say, I have more month at the end of my money. You know, it's just, I don't even have anything left over. What's interesting is, whatever this number is, and we recommend <coughs> for our clients, take a period of 30 days and just track your expenses. Has anybody ever done that, like either in your a phone app, you do that on a regular basis? Okay. Fantastic. And here's the thing, if you at least do it for 30 days, so number one, you're gonna find out where your money is going, okay? But you're also gonna do what? Because you're tracking it. You're gonna be conscious, you're gonna spend a little bit less because you're keeping track of it. It's hap it happens all the time. You become consciously competent at, at being, you know, a little bit spent of the spend through. So the bottom line is, if you can increase your income, that's a great thing, because that's, that's gonna drive your, your discretionary income. Maybe that's whatever, could be getting an Uber job or something like that. A lot of people do that. They say, hey, that's gonna be my spending money or that's gonna be saving. Okay, that's one option. You can also decrease expenses. Okay, so part of that might be your lifestyle expenses. Maybe you say, hey, okay, I can cut back here and save an extra hundred bucks a month. Okay, whatever it may be, or I can, we work with our clients all the time on different ways to do this. Sometimes there's different ways you can restructure your debt, where you're lowering your payments if you have debt, or you've got um, different ideas. Yep, do you have a question? Oh, okay. Um, different ideas on how you can uh, free up some money, reduce insurance premiums. We see a lot of times people paying way too much in that area, or auto insurance, deductibles are in the wrong place and they're paying too much. So there's a lot of ways to free up some, and it could be some money here, some money there, and then all of a sudden you have an extra 100 bucks a month and without even changing your lifestyle. One of the things that we look at though, if you think about your expenses, what is typically, and I'll bet it is pretty much for everybody in this room, uh, what is your largest single expense that you have? Okay, 99% of people say that, but I'll bet there's one that might be even higher. Lunches every Okay, even higher than that. I spent a lot on lunch, but even higher than that. What's that? So think about that, what's that? Think about something else that, that, uh, that comes out of your paycheck or the end of the year you gotta pay, taxes. So think about this. Think about all the different types of taxes. You've got federal tax, income tax. You've got state tax, potentially city tax. You've got sales tax when you make purchases. You've got real estate tax if you own a home. So think about what that percentage is, okay? You could be looking at 30, 40. We have some clients that were at 50% plus, even 60% of their money was going to taxes in some form or another. So here's the interesting thing. The IRS readily admits that uh, many people, a majority of people are paying more than they need to in income taxes because of what? They don't know what to do. They don't know the tax code. They don't know the l different loopholes in the way. They don't know the strategies that are available to them. So what we find is the average person uses one or two strategies to reduce their taxes. They may have a mortgage where your interest, deduct interest is deductible, or they may use a, a retirement plan like a thrift savings plan or an IRA or 401k or whatever it may be. Okay, but there's a ton of other different things you can do. Okay, and we're gonna talk about it a little bit later, some, some ideas around taxes, but what we find is sometimes we can help our clients save, it might be 100 bucks, it might be 200, it might be 300 a month in taxes, that now you have that money to save. See where I'm getting at? So it's beyond what you may just think, you may be just thinking, okay, hey, I've only got X amount at the end of the month. Well, 
My guess is you may not. You may have much more than that. We've helped our clients double, sometimes triple their discretionary income because of really taking a look at you know, where that money's going, reducing taxes, finding some idle money that's slipping through the cracks, that type of stuff. All right, does that make sense? Okay, so when you get that number that you're saving, think about what, what's important about this. You wanna get this, you wanna make this as easy as possible, out of sight, out of mind, right? Has anybody done an automatic savings plan? You're using a retirement plan coming out of your paycheck, something, yep. Or you can even, if whatever, wherever you're, you could be saving into a whole bunch of different things and you can just tell the investment company, hey, on the 15th of every month, I wanna take it out of my checking account and just put it away. That way you don't have to write a check. Because every time you have to write a check, you have to make a decision. And you're like, do I wanna do this this month? It's, it's harder to do. If you don't have to think about it and it's on autopilot, then your chances of saving more money go up. That makes sense? So put the odds in your favor by doing these little things that will help you save more. Because even if you save that much more, it could mean a ton. Hey, how are you? Come on in. Yeah, no problem. Um, it, there was that little bit of difference over 10 years, 15 years, five years, whatever, makes a huge difference in terms of results, right? Even if you can just do this much more, at the end of the you know, rainbow, you got a pot that's this much bigger. Okay, so that's the big thing. It's all about financial planning, it's all about doing these little things that add up to a lot. Okay, stack together a lot of the little things. All right, cool? Okay, so the other thing with financial planning <coughs> is it helps you do a couple of things. So part of it is identifying, I talked about, hey, you know, financial planning is getting from point A to point B. You need to understand what point A is, which is your current situation. You've got to get a really good handle on that first so that you can figure out, okay, we can work together on, okay, what's going to be the next, the right plan? How do I get from point A to point B? What you also have to figure out is your goals. We talked about ways to set goals and good goals. You have to understand what your options are that are available to you. That picture seems to be cutting off some of the words. Uh, and you have to then develop the plan that's going to be comfortable to you. So here's the thing. Any kind of game plan that you put together, or when we work with our clients that we put together, there's a likability factor with it. And even though something may make sense, if you don't like it and you don't feel good about it, you're not going to do it or you're not going to stick to it, right? Just like anything else. Um, if you go to a gym and start working out, if you don't enjoy it, it's going to be in some part of it, whether it's how you feel afterwards or the results or whatever, you're probably not going to stick with it. If it's too hard or undo doable, you've got to develop a plan that makes sense that you feel good about, okay? And that's just knowing you. Okay, here's, here's why I know me and I know when this happens, I don't do this or whatever, I can't stick to things, so I need accountability, you know, and that's, that's, that's all part of this, is starting on the plan and sticking to it. The other thing too is, we talk about helping our clients plan for the certainty of uncertainty. Because the one thing you know is that things are gonna change, right? They're gonna change whether we, that could be situations, in, that could be part of uh, things in your life so it could be job changes, could be marriages, could be divorces, could be births, could be deaths, could be buying a house, selling a house, buying a business, investing in something, could be tax changes, could be the economy around you, could be presidential changes, all kinds of stuff that are gonna impact your personal economy, right? So you have to steer the ship, you've gotta always be monitoring your progress on it. So it's not just set it and forget it, but you gotta keep looking at it and making sure that you're on track, okay? One of the other things that an advisor will do, <coughs> and this is not my pitch to work with an advisor, but what you have to understand, I've been doing this for 22 years. I'm a certified financial planner. I have a financial advisor. I actually pay an advisor every year for advice. And the reason why is it's not so much the advice, but what does the advisor do for me that I can't do for myself? Tells the truth. <laughs> Tells the truth. Sometimes I don't want to hear it, absolutely. Uh, slaps me in the head sometimes if I'm going to do something dumb. But what oftentimes, everybody in this room has made bad decisions before, including me, including Greg, including everybody. Uh, when you've made bad decisions, what tends to cause you to make bad decisions? What gets in the way of making good decisions? Emotions, absolutely right. So if you think about it, and it could be whether you're in an emotionally high state, which means you could be overconfident, make bad decisions because things are going really well, you assume it's gonna continue going well, what could go wrong? 
you know, I'm in a great job, I'm making all kinds of money, blah, 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 and then all of a sudden something happens, I made a bad decision. It could be a low uh, emotional point. It could be frustration, depression, anger, anxiety. You don't do well when you make decisions in either of those spots. Oh, uh, abnormally high, excited, overconfident, or low. So when you're making your decisions, make sure you're kind of at a level point. Take the emotions out of it. That is something an advisor can help you do. Someone else is gonna take those emotions out of it for you. All right, does that make sense? Okay, all right, so a couple things. Let's talk about protection planning. A couple things that people tend to overlook. One part of protection planning is having an emergency savings. Okay, believe it or not, 40% of Americans have no savings. They do live paycheck to paycheck. Okay, um, and it's easy to get caught in that trap unless you're doing things consciously to get you out of that trap. What's a good rule of thumb of how much you should be keeping in a cash reserves? Okay, at least three months. Three to six months is typically of expenses, of your fixed expenses, like your mortgage, your car payment, you know, food, all that kind of stuff. Three to six months ideally. What, what do I mean when I say cash reserve? What are examples of places that you keep cash reserve? Savings accounts, something that's like little 30 days maybe? Yeah, well, something that would take 30 days to get might be a little uh, less liquid. Uh, it could be a CD that's coming due every th 30 days. But uh, money market account, savings account, checking account, those are typical types of cash reserve vehicles. All right, uh, you wanna keep roughly 30 to 60, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, three months to six months. Uh, we've seen some people that have income, if you work on commission or something, or business owners sometimes will need more because you don't know when you're gonna go through a two month dry spell uh, or three month or whatever and you need that more. If you have more stability in your income, it's coming in every single week or every couple of weeks, maybe you need a little bit less, all right? The tough thing is people get trapped into getting into debt because they don't have cash reserves, right? So you have credit card debt and all that stuff. That can be this downward spiral because you accumulate more and more of it and then you kind of feel trapped and you feel stressed, the thing that we don't want to have happen because it's like, God, I got to pay these minimum payments. I feel like the balance is not going down. I had another, my car broke down. She said, I've got no place to access money. I got to build up the balance on the credit card again. Okay, so what you want to be doing is trying to pay that down while you're building up your cash reserve. We've had some people that have focused so much on trying to pay that credit card debt down, but they forget the reason they're in credit card debt because they didn't have the cash reserve to begin with. All right. For those of you who own a home, what could also be a, another part of your cash reserve as an emergency? Home equity. Okay, so. Uh, we always advise clients, open up a home equity line of credit, whether you think you need it or not. Don't spend it, don't use it. So a home equity line of credit, if you've got 100 grand of equity, or 200 grand of equity, or 300, whatever it is, you can actually open up a home equity line of credit, which allows you to tap into that in case of an emergency. They'll send you a, a checkbook, or even a credit card. A little dangerous, so you gotta really be careful of this. You don't wanna be spending it at all for day-to-day for, for -day uses. But keeping it open is, is, is important because when you need it, if something really happened and you were in a really tough spot, when you would need to get it, you can't get it. Sounds counterintuitive, but if you were in a tough spot, you lost your job or you had medical expenses or kind of disaster struck, then you tried to open up a home equity line of credit, no good. You're not going to be able to. You're going to have difficulty with it. Okay, so when things are good, that's when you want to open it. Okay, again, don't touch it, don't use it, just have it open, keep a zero balance on it. All right, does that make sense? Okay. Uh, life insurance, 30% of people have no life insurance. Okay, that is alarming, especially as you've seen, you know, all kinds of stuff that happens uh, nowadays in society. You just don't know. Knock on wood, we all feel good and we're healthy and we hope nothing happens, but if something does, are your loved ones, your spouse, your significant other, your kids, are they protected, okay? And if you don't have life insurance, then oftentimes that's gonna really mean a pretty disastrous situation for the people you leave behind. Okay, getting life insurance can be a lot easier than you think, regardless of what your health issues are, you know, it's something you do have to apply for. Uh, but what I will tell you is what's important about life insurance is you have the right amount and also the right type. Okay. I've seen people that have too much insurance and too little. That's not good. I've also seen people that have the totally wrong type of insurance. Does everybody know there's actually different types of life insurance? Anybody aware of what they are? 
Uh, yeah, pretty much. Let me, uh, is there a, um, oh, here we go. Let me just, can I erase this? Is it okay? Okay. So let me give you a quick insurance 101. And here's what to look for. So one is you've got term insurance, which think of this as temporary insurance. It's kind of like renting an apartment. Why do you rent an apartment? Well, it's easy, it's low cost, it's usually temporary, not always, but it's usually temporary. And how term insurance works is let's say you have a death benefit of 500,000, okay? Um, if these are the premiums, and this is your age, as you get older, those premiums go up. That's typically how it works, okay? The insurance company is banking on the fact that you're gonna let it lapse before you lapse. Okay, so they're banking on the fact that you're, it's gonna get so expensive, you're not gonna be able to keep it up. And in fact, Greg, what are the statistics? What percentage of term policies go unpaid? Is it 98%? 98%, like 98% go, un, meaning that nobody gets the death benefit. The insurance company wins out. Okay, what they've come up with is level term policies, which means that you're paying more early, <coughs> You're underpaying, it might be a 10 year, 15, 20, there's even 30 year level term policies. But again, you've got it locked in, it won't go up, but at the end of that period of time, guess what happens? It like skyrockets up. So again, the insurance company's banking on the fact it's gonna get too expensive. So I caution you about that only because I've seen, you know, 2% of those pot pay out. Most of the time they don't. Okay, it's cheap, that's the good thing. What there is also is there's, there, well, I'm just gonna categorize this because, and you had given some great examples of um, whole and universal, there's variable universal life, there's index universal life. These all fall into what we call the permanent category. <coughs> and it's called cash value insurance. And you have two components. You have insurance, and then you have the cash value. And what's different about all these, whole life, universal life, index universal life, it all comes down to how this works, the cash value, okay? Real simply, what happens is you have a death benefit and when you put in money, a portion goes to pay for the insurance and the rest goes to build the cash value, okay? Um, a lot of business owners or even people in high income tax brackets will use this because it's a great tax shelter. Because here's the interesting thing, whatever you put into this cash value, whatever builds up, you can pull out and you pay no taxes. Doesn't matter if you put in <coughs> 20 grand over a few years and it builds to 200 grand, you pull that out entirely tax free. So there's a lot of people that, and myself included, that use this as kind of a future retirement to create a tax free stream of income. So it can be really effective for that. In addition, if you're, who's saving for college for kids? Okay, anybody? Okay, if you do, this can be a good college savings vehicle because it's one of the few things that does have tax benefits that you can get at before you're 59 and a half. And financial aid assessment also doesn't look at this money at all. You could have a million dollars in here and on the FAFSA form, which is your financial aid form, you, they don't see anything, it's zero. So you can actually qualify for financial aid and have this, okay? So there are pros and cons with each of this. This tends to be more expensive than this, okay? But it is designed as permanent protection, so you keep it forever, really. You know, and you might shrink down the amount of insurance you have and you just have really the cash value part. But part of it, again, is, is understanding the different types that are out there, okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the taxes. If you pay into that though long enough, say, say a 10 year time frame, could sustain itself so you're not paying for it at all. You got all That's the other time. great point, I forgot to bring that up. So this, you have a lot of flexibility. You can increase, you can decrease what you put in, or you can stop paying altogether when you've built up that cash value. So that's typically what you'll do. You might pay for that. A lot of people use it as a retirement savings vehicle. They'll save into it until retirement, and then they'll switch it into an income. Then they'll just take a paycheck from it every week or month, whatever. Yeah, yeah, good point. All right. Cool. So that's insurance, and without a doubt, whatever makes sense for you, that's going to be unique to your situation, but the important thing is get some type of coverage. If you have coverage <coughs> excuse me, through work, 
<coughs> employer coverage is only good while you're there. If you get fired, laid off, you leave, you retire, it's gone. So that day you leave for the most part, all right? Uh, same thing with disability insurance. It's interesting because one in five people, that's a high statistic, <coughs> one in five people go out on disability for a period of time. Um, and that is a alarming statistic. And I'm not talking about disabled in the sense that we might think of somebody disabled. It's not in a wheelchair, it's not handicapped, it is just not able to work. Any guesses on what the leading causes of somebody being out of work is for more than three months? There's two, two that are number one and number two. Back is one, absolutely. Any guess on the other? Mental? Yeah, stress, yeah, great guess. Those two things are the two leading causes. So, you know, somebody has a spike in blood pressure, you know, they go to the doctor, the doctor's like, wow, you were under way too much stress, time out. For your health, you're gonna be out of work. That's a, that's a disability, okay? So a lot of employers will provide disability coverage, but oftentimes it's only a small portion or it's only for a short period of time. Okay, your income is the most powerful asset you have, your ability to earn income. It makes sense to look at this. Okay, not everybody needs it, but a lot more people need it than they think. Okay, because again, whatever you may have through work or, or whatnot may not cover you. And then long-term care insurance, that's dealing down the road when you are retired or maybe not, but at some point needing long-term care um, due to health care uh, issues. Um, anybody have a relative that went to a nursing home or long-term care facility? Not cheap. No, it's not. It's, it's crazy. The average expense right now is over $90,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Not counting medications or anything like that. It's just for the nursing home. And if it's at home care, which is preferable usually, it's even more than that. What right? do you recommend for that long-term care insurance? Say, <coughs> That's a good question. Age to get it. I, um, it depends a little bit on your family history. So I usually would say 50, you know, in that range, uh, 50s, because it's cheaper and your likelihood of getting it, it's not an easy coverage to get because insurance companies know the risks are very high. Um, so you want to time it, you want to be on the earlier side because you can also get lower premiums. I had a client though that we just did it, they were in their late 40s and because they had their, um, both parents were in nursing homes, had bad situations, so they kind of felt that was important to them. So, but I'd say 50s. All right, so any questions on this? <clears throat> okay, all right. <clears throat> we talked about some of this already, uh, so I'm not gonna hit on this um, unless you want to dive into anything more in particular, but this is the elements of a strong protection plan, okay? And again, it's kind of like building a foundation of a house, or building a house. You've gotta have that foundation really rock solid, okay, which is making sure that you have adequate cash reserves, you have life insurance, disability protection, you have the things that will safeguard you against the unexpected. Okay, then you build the house, the rest of the house is gonna be much more stable, all right? So let's talk a little bit about wealth accumulation. So what's amazing about this is that when you use time on your side, it takes a lot less to accumulate money, or that money will really start working for you. Um, so a great example here, and this is assuming a 7% annual rate of return, okay, these examples here. If you look all the way on the left, you've got somebody, his name is John, who saved $100 a month for 32 years between the age of 33 to 65, okay? 32 years of savings, that grows at $100, $100 a month, grew to 143,000, okay? Look at Jane who saved only for 10 years, a third of the time, but did it from age 22 to 32, and then stopped. Didn't save another dime after that. Her money grew to 174,000, even though she only saved a third of the time. And take a look, if Bill saved 100 months for 45, uh, 43 years, then look at the effects of that, 329 grand. Okay, 100 bucks a month can actually do a lot. Okay, really can. But again, the importance of starting earlier. And then if you can turn 100 into 200, meaning maybe you can save some taxes or some other types of things, that's really big. What's interesting is, um, here's a cool way to think about investing and, and getting your money working for you. Anybody heard of the rule of 72? 
Okay, this is a cool um, rule. Cool rule. That uh, can I erase this? Is it good? Okay. So here's what the rule of 72 says. <laughs> the rule of 72 tells you if you divide into 72 the certain interest rate or rate of return that you're getting on an investment, it will tell you how long it will take for that investment to double. So let's say, for example, I was earning 7% on my money on an average basis. I divide 7 into 72, what is that? Roughly 10. So that means every 10 years, my money will double. So if I had 100 grand in an account that was earning 7% a year, if I didn't add a penny to it, in 10 years it would be worth 200 grand. In 20 years it would be worth 400 grand. It's pretty big, right? So that's kind of a neat role. What's also important to realize is if you change these numbers, it makes a pretty dramatic difference. Let's say instead of earning 7%, you're able to earn 9%. Maybe you diversify your investments better, you use some better choices. What is nine divided into 72? Eight years, right? And every eight years it's gonna double. That 100 is gonna to grow to 208 years. In 16 years it's gonna be 400. Okay, in 32 years it's gonna be 800. 100 grown to 800 with that type of return. So when we work with clients, even those little adjustments, balancing your investments a little bit different, uh, you know, spreading them out a little bit more, lining it with your risk tolerance. If it's an extra 1% or 2% that it earns you, that's a big deal. It may not sound it or seem it, but trust me, when you look at your statements, 10 years, 15, 20 years down the road, it's a big deal. It's a major difference, okay? What do you think is the biggest mistake people make with investing? Take it out. Okay, take it out at the wrong time, okay? So you have all kinds of stuff, and I was explaining this to a client earlier, and I said, we were talking about retirement and they were putting money into their, their 401k plan. And they said, realize something, if the market were to drop 500 points tomorrow, does that impact you? And their answer was, well, yeah, I guess. I said, well, it really doesn't because those prices that you see in the paper for the stocks or, or for, you know, uh, for what the market's doing, that's not really your prices, so to speak. That's what's happened in the market today. But if this is money you're not using for the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years, what happens today really doesn't have any impact. Same way if it went up 500 points. You know, don't be jumping around and, you know, hey, planning the next vacation. It's just not, it's day to day is not gonna mean that much. You've gotta be able to ride the volatility. So if you're comfortable with an investment, if you're seeking an investment that actually has the potential to go up 30%, what does it also have the potential to do? Go down 30%. You've gotta ask yourself, hey, if it did go down 30%, if my $100,000 account that I worked so hard and saved up those money went down to 70 grand, what would I do? And if your answer is, well, I would sell, I'd liquidate, then you're in the wrong investments. That's not appropriate for you. Now, what there are now are investments, and when I was um, going through a minute ago the insurance, there's investments where they will give you a floor. So, for example, we've worked recently with some clients where we helped them get invested into something where they had a 1% floor, where you can't get lower than that. Doesn't matter if the market goes down 10 or 15%. Every year you're gonna earn a minimum one, and they give you a cap of like maybe 11.5%. So if the market went up 20%, you're only gonna earn, 11, not only, but you're gonna earn 11.5%, but you have kind of guardrails on it. Kind of cool. So companies have come up with u new, new unique things like that to help take a little bit of the emotions out of it. Give you a little bit more peace of mind and still give you some growth potential. All right, makes sense. But the biggest mistake people make is they move things. You know, I, I talked to people and I said, well, well, what made you do this or how did you pick this investment? And they'll say, you know, I, I talked to my office mate next to me or the person, my buddy at the gym or my best friend who had, doesn't know financial planning or anything, but the, somehow there's this trust level because my friend said to do something, I feel like it's okay, but you're talking about your money and that can make a big difference. Okay, so uh, being educated and knowing what your options is important. So, all righty. Okay, let's keep going here. <laughs> Whoops. Okay, diversification is key. Okay, so think about it like uh, envision a, a window pane. 
You know those big picture windows where it's like a bunch of panes of windows, a uh, bunch of pain, window panes? If you threw a ball, you know, threw a baseball through that window, it might knock out one or two of those panes, right? But if you didn't have a window pane, it was just one big window and you threw a ball through it, the whole window's gone, right? Diversification is kind of the same way. So just by spreading out your assets, not putting every egg in one basket, so to speak, you're helping because as certain things are going down, other things are going up. And the overall pool of money is taking a little bit of a smoother ride. Okay, that's really key. It's gonna be based on your time frame and your risk tolerance. Okay, those are gonna be the things most important to determining what you should be investing in. And whether that's a 401k plan, thrift savings plan, mutual funds, stocks, whatever it is, choosing the balance of where you're investing what is gonna be based on your risk level and your time frame. Okay, shorter the time frame. Should you be more aggressive or more conservative? Yeah, so if I was saving for a house down payment in three years. Most people would think that, but think about this. You can't afford, if you're too aggressive, then it's gonna, then it might actually drop at the time you've gotta pull it out. So typically shorter the time period, you wanna be a little bit more conservative. Longer the time period, like retirement, you can afford to be more aggressive, because hey, if it did drop 20%, you got a lot of time to make it up, right? So that's part of the, the issue. You also wanna think about taxes as well. Here's a really, interesting concept <laughs> I like doing a lot of drawing so I always learn that better that way and sometimes if somebody explains something to me I draw it out and it just it made sense and it stuck with me more so there's something that that we work on a lot called helping people manage their get better tax control and if you think about it there's three different places that you can save money three different types of accounts Okay, one is you can put money into accounts where it goes in after tax, meaning it's already been taxed in your paycheck, so you're dealing with your after tax money. And when it comes out or as it's growing, it's taxable. So maybe each year, interest in dividends or it's growing and you have capital gains. What kind of what might be examples of accounts that would fall into this category? Savings accounts. Savings, yep, you got it. Checking, money markets, what else? How about stocks, mutual funds? Pretty much anything. So this might be, uh, I put in 10 grand, it grows to 20 grand. I gotta pull it out, I've gotta pay for capital gains taxes. Okay, it could be CDs, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Most of the time, when we think about just investing, it falls into this category, all right? There's another group where when we put it in, it goes in pre-tax, and when we pull it out, it is 100% taxable. Can you think of anything that goes in here? 401k, yep. IRAs. IRA, you got it. Uh, for, there's other types of accounts called 403b accounts or thrift savings plans. These are the, the retirement types of accounts that are provided through organizations that you work for or companies, okay, payroll deduction goes in there, you're saving taxes today, it's nice, but when you pull it out, it's 100% taxable. We call this, it's kind of like a ticking tax time bomb, okay, because people don't realize at some point, it feels good now, but at some point, you're gonna pay taxes. You know, if somebody had a million dollars in here, they don't really have a million dollars, because the IRS has a stake of claim of about 400 of that. You have about 600 of that. You realize that? So it's a tough pill to swallow when we're with a client and we're looking at a statement and we're like, okay, do you realize that that's not all yours? Okay, the IRS is sitting there and they're excited because they know they're gonna get that at some point, okay? Then there's another uh, group where, another uh, part of, um, category where you're putting in after-tax money and when you're pulling it out, it's 100% tax-free. Anything come to mind there? Roth, yep, you got it. Anything else? Anybody heard of a 529? College savings vehicle, okay. Uh, we just talked about one of them, the cash value insurance is another, okay. Uh, municipal bonds, that's another one. So Roth IRAs, there's a limit on what you can put in. 
and as your income grows, then you may not be able to put anything in. Um, and it is for retirement, okay? Uh, 529s can only be used for college. If you use them for anything else, you gotta pay taxes and you gotta pay a 10% penalty um, on what you pull out on the growth, all right? So you gotta be careful of that. I've seen people that put too much in that and then it's like the kid doesn't go to college or whatever, you're kind of stuck. Uh, cash value insurance, as we talked about, can be a great option. Um, there are no, there, there are much bigger limits on what you can put into it. A lot of flexibility. Uh, not everybody qualifies for that, so that's a, another component. Municipal bonds, you got to be careful. Interest rates are they going up or down? Interest rates probably going to be going up, which means bond values go down. So you want to be a little careful of that. So you know you want to choose these correctly. But here's the key thing: if you think about these three buckets, where do most people have their money? Do you think the average? Most people have it up here or down here. Vast majority of people have very, very little here, right? So let me give you a quick example. If you were in retirement time and you're trying to get $100,000 of income, if you're pulling it out of this bucket and you're trying to net $100,000, how much would you have to pull out? Yeah, you know, at least $125, maybe $140, you know, somewhere around that range. So, you know, you're taking home $100, IRS is getting $25 or forty grand. How about here, if it's fully taxable? You know, probably 150 plus, right? What about here? 100. Take out 100, you net 100. So, you know, and then the natural question is, okay, well, why don't I put everything in this bucket? Uh, just like diversification, you want to diversify your tax strategies too. But you don't want to put everything here. You don't want to put everything here. You want to balance it out, okay, and build a good strategy. All right, does that make sense? Okay, so that's a lot of what we do too is kind of, making sure you're building, not just building for the sake of building, but doing it in a smart way, because it's all not about what you make, it's what you keep, right? At the end of the day, it's all about what, what lands in your hands. Okay, oh, keep losing my thing, here we go, okay. <clears throat> Alrighty, so, <clears throat> a couple things that are important is you put your plan together. It's important to know what your risk tolerance is, as we talked about, you don't want to be in something too risky, and then you end up pulling your money out, making the wrong decision because emotionally you don't want to handle it or you can't handle it, okay? You got to be in something that fits your risk level, right? Uh, you want something that's long-term, okay? Not short-term, double my money. That's not going to work, okay? To build wealth, it's going to be, it's going to take consistency, much more powerful to do a little bit consistently over a long period of time, all right? And then a commitment to seeing it through, which means making sure you got the heart to Keep going, not just start it, but you know, keep it going, all right? And by the way, we look, at, um, we look at one of the most important numbers that we look at is somebody's net worth, which basically is their assets minus their liabilities, and that's your net worth. Has anybody tracked their net worth or figured that out? Okay, so here's what I would encourage you to do. And <laughs> this is something we can do with you, we can help, help you do it, figure it out, relatively easy. But that's a good way to kind of figure out point A. And then if you just track your net worth on a regular basis, you're gonna find some really good, um, you know, you're gonna find you're making progress and you're gonna be able to say, okay, am I moving in the right direction or wrong direction? Okay, there's three ways to build your net worth. One is to pay down your debt, one is to save systematically, and the other is to get your investments working harder for you. Okay, usually all three of those will make sense. Okay, a few stats on um, Social Security, on uh, retirement. Social Security was never meant to be the mainstay of anybody's retirement plan. It was meant to be a supplement. So you have to treat it. That's why 401ks and IRAs and Roth IRAs were invented because they wanted to encourage people to save because the government's not going to be in a position to sustain and subsidize everybody's retirement. 36% <coughs> of total income for Americans is Social Security okay, in retirement, age 65. There's a decline of pensions. So a long time ago, you know, our generations ahead of us were, uh, above us were making, were, their retirement was pension. It was like you work for a company for a long period of time and they're gonna pay you for life. All sounds great until they don't have money anymore to continue paying you for life and that's what you've relied on, okay? Anybody know anybody that was, was had a pension and they went bankrupt or any of the pension fund? Okay, been tons of examples of that. So pensions are getting more rare. Uh, you may have a company that puts in money into what's called a cash balance pension plan. They put a 
you know, percentage of your income in each year, and then you, what you do with it is what you do with it at retirement. So the onus is becoming more on you, not the company or not the government. Uh, increasing health care costs. Estimated an average 65-year-old couple need 260 grand for health care. That's like a college education. You know, that's, that's what average health care is just during retirement. 49% uh, of re Americans retired earlier than planned, not because of pleasurable reasons, but because of health, because they were laid off. Uh, anybody know somebody like that, that they retired early because of not necessarily wanting to or planning it? It wasn't like they did a big retirement party. It was just one day they woke up and oh, I guess I'm retired. <laughs> you know, not, not the way to plan it. And then living longer lives. This is cool, but it also cannot be cool if you haven't planned. Retirement nowadays, there are people that are retired for longer than they're working. That's not out of the question at all. Anybody know somebody 100 years old or has known of anybody? Okay. That's becoming more and more common. Um, you know, people living longer, healthcare advances, all that kind of stuff, and us figuring out, okay, what makes the body tick a little better and take care of ourselves. Well, the good part of that is we live longer, but the bad part is we've now got a much longer retirement to plan for. Okay, so all these things are obstacles that people are facing with retirement, all right? Here's an interesting number. If you wanted to save a million bucks and retire at age 65, uh, to save a million dollars, this would be the monthly savings, depending on when you started, makes a huge difference, right? Now these numbers may look like huge. This is total money. This is monthly. Now we're talking about a million bucks. This is not just maybe your money. This could be company matches. If you have a 401k a company match or a 403b, but if you're looking at your age 30 and you're assuming a 6% or an 8% growth, you're looking at 400 to 700 bucks a month to accumulate a million bucks. Now, do you need a million dollars? It's totally up to you. It's up to your situation. I don't know. We could figure that out based on the type of retirement you want to live. But um, if you wait, that number grows significantly. Okay, that goes up a lot. You can see it doubles or triples the amount that you have to save. So again, my point on this is starting earlier makes it a lot easier. Use the time on your side. All right. <coughs> I didn't put that up, up there to bum me out. <laughs> put it up there. Pretty blessing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll skip, we'll skip right past it. Okay. Um, okay, a couple of simple things with the state plan. I'm not going to go into it in too much depth. The bottom line is that if you do a great job and you build up your estate, the government can take a big chunk of it. Uh, you may be inheriting an estate from a loved one at some point, and you may find that you go through and have to deal with the probate process, and it's ugly and expensive and public and lengthy and all that. Uh, bottom line is there's some simple things that you can do to make sure that you've planned for your estate. Okay? If you don't have a will, the state of Massachusetts has one for you. It may not be what you want to have happen and probably isn't, okay? Just do a simple thing and do a will. If you took one step out of here and that was the one action step, get a will in place. You can do it even online if you needed to or go to an attorney that doesn't cost a lot of money, doesn't have to, and just make sure your wishes are put down on paper and it's legally binding, all right? Guardian on kids, all that kind of stuff is important. Um, in addition, Things, what we find that people tend to forget about is uh, who has any kind of account, life insurance, IRA, 401k, where they've had to name a beneficiary. Okay, I cannot tell you how many, what percentage of people have a mistake in their, either they forgot to change a beneficiary, they have an ex-spouse, they pass away and it goes to their ex-spouse. Totally didn't mean to do that, but wow, I totally forgot to go in and change my beneficiary or they don't have a beneficiary. They opened up a new 401k or an account and they just said, hey, I'll come back to that or they skipped that section on the form or they didn't have all the information on the form. And bottom line is what happens is then it goes into your state. What you want to have happen doesn't happen. A beneficiary saves a ton of time, saves a ton of money. So something were happen to me and I've got beneficiary designations on it, it bypasses probate, it bypasses any, a will, it doesn't matter. It just goes right to that person who you want it to go to. All right, so that's important. So another action step is double check your beneficiaries on, on stuff, all right? And again, there's three places your money and everything is gonna go at the time you pass away. It's either gonna go to who you want it to, your heirs, it's gonna go to a charity if you want that, or it's gonna go to the government. You might not want that, probably not. All right, so we can help you avoid that piece of it, all right? 
Okay. Wills, trusts, charitable giving, life insurance is part of estate planning. Okay, so making sure that you've done the right things in that area, passing on what you want, all right? <coughs> Last piece that I wanna cover is business planning. Um, and I don't wanna run into this too much because there may not be business owners in here or you may not have an interest. Does anybody run a business in here or have a self-employed, self-employed? Okay. Um, I can cover this for a couple minutes or not? I don't. A couple minutes, okay. So here's what I will tell you. Um, business owners oftentimes we find are just too much focused. They're working in their business. They don't forget to take the time out to manage their finances. They don't take the time out to make sure they have a succession plan. Okay, so if something, we've had disastrous situations where um, you know two partners were working in a business. One of the partners passed away. They didn't have a succession plan which means what? Who would come in to replace the pa partner that passed away? Uh, the, the, what's that? Spouse. spouse. So that person's significant other, their spouse would come in as now the new partner. And that other partner may not want that, or that new spouse may not have anything knowledge on how to run the business, yet now they have a 50% stake. We've seen that so many times. So not having a good succession plan, or what's called a buy-sell agreement to arrange for what's gonna happen at death, that's gonna cause uh, issues. Could the business run smoothly without you? You know, Do you have the right plans in place? Do you have the right key people in place? Would your customers stay with you? And then what's also important is retaining employees, You know, having key, plan, uh, key employee planning. The worst thing with a business is the turnover, and if you lose a valuable employee, that can be disastrous for somebody's business too. You may be one of those valuable employees, so that's the other thing to think about. Okay, if I'm part of a business, maybe a small business, and my role, you know, I have a friend of mine who sa I said, hey, have you, do you have a succession plan? He said, well, my succession plan is, you know, my, or uh, do, is there key employee planning? In other words, are they doing something to make sure that they keep you? He said, well, yeah, because they know if I left, then all the clients would come with me. You know, I'm that valuable. I'm the one who started the relationships. I keep the relationships. Yeah, you may be in a situation where you are valuable uh, to a business and you may or may not be getting the rewards of that type of incentive. It's per we advise clients sometimes, hey, you know what? Talk to the business because sometimes they're not thinking through it and you could actually be doing much better financially and they're maybe willing to do things financially for you recognizing that, okay? No business wants to go through losing a key employee, all right? One third of business owners have no pension or retirement savings. Uh, that's crazy because there's some great tax benefits for the business owner and obviously it helps to retain and attract great employees as well. All right. And this is something we could talk to you more about if you're getting involved in business or you have a business or this is a future goal, helping to plan for it, make sure that you can uh, be ready at that time to, uh, to make the right decisions. Okay, so just to review a couple things. Um, <coughs> Financial independence doesn't just happen. It comes with planning, okay? And it's all about starting with setting goals, okay? Analyzing your current situation, okay? Figuring out where point A is. Um, then figuring out point B. What are my goals? Where do I wanna be? And what's that gap look like, okay? I'm here, I wanna be here, okay? There's a gap and I've gotta solve for that gap. And then it's figuring out what plan makes the most sense, okay? What a good advisor will do is they'll say, hey, there's two or three different ways you could get to your goal. Here's one option, here's two options, here's three options, here's what I would recommend, but what is your decision? So you're the CEO of your personal economy. You know, you may have a CFO, which is your advisor advising you, but you're the one making the decision because you're the one living the life, right? Um, <laughs> and then uh, monitor regularly. We see too often people, you know, they don't touch, their, they just kind of set it, forget it, they don't look at it, they don't touch it. Not a bad thing from the standpoint that you're not tempted to do something bad like take it out or you know, cash it out, but you do wanna review progress because of so many changes that happen. What's making sense, it's kinda of like driving from here to California, okay, and you didn't have a GPS or anything like that and you were just driving and you started heading west. You know, if you didn't check your progress for a day, you might find, wow, I'm like way off course. I thought I was going west and I'm going southwest or I'm in the wrong state. If you checked your progress like every hour and knew that you're on the right path and the right road, your chances of getting there faster are gonna go up. Okay, so that's the review in progress. Um, and then adjusting the circumstances as they evolve, okay? More time you have to prepare, the less time you have to worry about it later. 
But again, if you leave with nothing else, take some kind of action, okay? And what I will tell you, e easy first step is leave this uh, workshop, write down three goals that you want to accomplish and make sure it passes a SMART test. Okay, that's one easy action step because again, your chances of reaching those goals are gonna go up just because you wrote them down, carry them with you. Even if you did, hey, I want these goals accomplished by the next seven weeks before the end of the year. That's kind of a cool little game. I actually have a friend of mine. We do monthly breakfast meetings. We just did it today, actually. Tuesday morning, we do it once a month at 7 a.m. We get together at a restaurant and we go through goals. And uh, we're just friends and we set three goals. We set a business goal, a personal goal, and then a professional development goal. Uh, and it's fun. But sometimes you can get a friend to do that little accountability plan with you. You know, and then we have little games, you know, like if we both accomplish our goals, let's go out and have a nice steak dinner or something like that. You know, or hey, if I get my goals and you don't get my goals and you buy me dinner, or whatever, you can have some fun with it. You know, it doesn't have to be you living in your own little bubble in your own silo. You can, you can team up with some friends, okay? Do you do like short term or small goals, short term, long term goals? Great point, yes. So w I do something called a witty wiffy, which is what do you want for yourself? I do it every year and it's a one year game plan, but then there's that three year and five year part to it too, absolutely. Have longer term goals that each year can kind of build on. Uh, you might have a goal like retirement that might be 20 years out, but the clearer you can make that goal, also the likely, higher likelihood you can get there, all right? Um, and then the other action step is I highly encourage you to take advantage of an opportunity to sit down with us. Um, no obligation at all. We'll just sit down. Uh, we'll pass out the feedback forms. I love your feedback on today. Um, and if there's anything that you liked or didn't like, let us know. If there are questions you have, you can let us know. Um, but I believe there's a box on there. Is that right, Greg, to check? Yes. So if you'd like to take advantage of that, just check the box. And then Greg will be giving you a buzz tomorrow uh, to set something up at your convenience. And he'll talk a little bit over the phone of what you want to accomplish, what you want to talk about. And then uh, based on that, I'll tell you what you need to have ready for that meeting and we'll schedule it and we'd love to spend that time. If we can help you, we'll let you know. If we can't help you, we'll let you know. Either way, it'll be good use of time. All right. Was that helpful? Very helpful. Good, good. Great, great.